synergies that are developing through today. And I never thought that I would be around when I could listen to a presentation about data analysis that would be so useful because it, it's been quite a difficult journey to get to this point. So I'm really um, grateful. Okay, so children and young people's mental health, landing prevention, smoothing demand. So demand is ever on the rise, um, uh, but we need to understand the nature and degree of the demand to smooth demand so that by 2035, the, uh, the children of today and the adults of tomorrow will be able to be, pay full part in understanding their own mental health. So um, I'm privileged to chair the Children and People's Mental Health Coalition. We work with over 190 organisations to campaign and influence policy with and on behalf of children and young people in relation to their mental health and well-being. Uh, and you may say, well, 190 organisations? Well, yes, because mental health and lack of mental health is everywhere and that's both the challenge and the opportunity. We are proud to be recently hosted by the Centre for Mental Health uh, and that's been really important to us. We have to say who our sponsors are because that matters because it's, it's not a popular thing to get core funding for. And this picture just shows the diversity of those people we're involved with. So it's, it's the usual suspects and the unusual suspects. And what we're in the business of is a unified voice telling government, national and local, when things aren't working. But what we hope we do is give a voice to smaller as well as larger organisations, act as a critical friend, don't represent any particular organisation, collate views, connect up people, a solution-focused, evidence-based and values-based. And we've got links with the Netherlands and Scotland. So our, our priorities are a whole system approach, prevention, specialist provision, so children's and mental health system for all children and young people aged 0 to 25. And back when we started, we were already doing work with Public Health um, England about the absolute importance of mental health in educational settings without teachers feeling even more burdened than they are with the tasks that they're expected to do. And the other strand of what we do is around inequalities. Um, and I don't know whether there's been much mention of learning disability and neurodevelopmental disorders across the life course, but they're still prone to be forgotten. So um, we work with young people, so these are some perceptions from young people. So um, this is a group of young people in Sefton. That's their view of mental health, how, how it is, but they've just got money to do some more and they think it is changing. And this is their view of politicians. Um, so what we need, and I think this is what's been lacking, is good policy for health. So if you look at the work of SEN, talking about the rest of health. So policy across all areas needs to be aligned to promote health. Uh, as I say, back in 2010, we produced something for public health, England, which looks very much like the main proposals in the Children and Young People's Green Paper. And with our 190 organisations, we tried to tease out what the key things are. And you said, well, you've had to delphi those three things, what we've come out with. A better balance between attainment and well-being, better training and support for staff on mental health, and better support for children and young people when needed. We'll deliver better mental health and well-being. But of course, that was carried on against the background of targets where all that mattered was performance and behaviour. Now, even there, and I think this is part tribute to CQC's work, working with Ofsted, we're beginning to see a change. It's not just the scores on the doors that matters. If I ruled the world, I would make school exclusion illegal, but I'd help teachers. So what do, what do we want to see in the long-term plan? Prevention of mental health problems for infants, children and young people and families and this includes a universal as well as a targeted approach, but prevention should be at the heart of providing mental health interventions to those in need, so they get prompt and easy access to help, but good quality step-down care, and this is where the voluntary sector is so important. The second thing we put in as, as a set of organisations to the long-term plan, when Claire Murdoch put out the call, was the rebalancing of current and future investment in favour of early intervention. So we need to be bold. We need to learn a lot, I think, from what's happened in the recovery movement in adult mental health, to be person-centred, to listen to the voice of lived experience. And it means integrating NHS staff in other settings and actually trusting the voluntary sector to be doing a great deal more of this work, but with a proviso that somebody raised this morning. And it is about joint commissioning. And I just, you know, the, the guy from PHE this morning 
said one of the frustrations was not getting the reach of the JSNA in the toolkit, and it really is a really useful toolkit. So the third thing is workforce. So I declare that I'm the mental health advisor to HE. So everyone having the quality, skills and confidence to recognise and address the mental needs of infants, children and young people. But we need a workforce plan, and that's really what Lizzie was describing in the waterfall this morning. It's not just for NHS staff, but for anybody who works with this group, including the young people themselves. And we need to use a more diverse range of therapeutically trained staff. And this is absolutely about upskilling current staff and making them feel and um, feel valued in the workplace and to help them with resilience. I have a problem with well-being. It's a snapshot point in time. You've got it one minute, I could ask you. Ten minutes later, you'd have had a phone call and lost it. So the German word for well-being is well-becoming, and I want to introduce that to the language because I think it's more useful. So what everybody deserves, whatever level, whether they're doing mental health awareness training as a paediatric dentist, we all deserve to have a good competency framework. There's loads of waste in the NHS and social care, so we all have to do our um, safeguarding training. Why can't we all do it together in one big building every time there's a new appointment on an SDP patch? Then at least we'd know each other. There are lots of practical things we could be doing, which systems don't seem to allow us. So as well as the five-year future forward, we had future in mind in children's services. I think the one area where we failed was the vulnerable groups, because what happened was that there was a whole line of 250 vulnerable groups, all arguing and lobbying that their vulnerable group was more vulnerable than my vulnerable group. And what we need is common core cause. The prevalence study, uh, uh, please, please, if it's not out by the end of the year, start lobbying and asking why not, because without this we can't workforce plan and we can't intelligently commission. We need to help to shape the 10-year plan, and I ask a rhetorical question, when will we see the adult social care consultation, because that's life force, impacts on working age adults, it's hugely important for people with mental illness, and it's important for families living in adversity. Um, I'm wary of time and I've put some PowerPoints in that are here for you to take away because um, HE spent quite a lot of money in, in getting young minds to do a really fantastic piece of work that cut through my vulnerable groups more vulnerable than yours and I want you to be able to take that away and digest it and it, we, we're turning it into a, an e-learning module. So if on any patch you think simply, and I do, you have a thousand children. Where are we at the moment? And this is a Centre for Mental Health slide. One child in a thousand will have a very serious problem requiring hospital care, which will always emerge on a Friday afternoon, where they may have to wait 24 hours for a bed 200 miles away, by which time they need detention under the Mental Health Act, which wouldn't have been necessary if there was service close to Hound or enough workforce to have a wraparound service. 17 children may have a serious diagnosable difficulty needing specialist treatment, but because you don't reach a threshold for a diagnosis doesn't mean to see you don't need help. So we need to reconceptualise classifications. Diagnosis is important, but genomics might tell us we've got the categories wrong. We need to think about functioning for that child in their unique social context. And that's what the WHO means by classification. 70 children may have a common diagnosical problem. Around 150 in 1,000 may need extra help to prevent later crises. And every child has the right the actual, absolute right to have the best start in life, which understands, involves understanding their own mental health and well-becoming. So what we're after is a rights-based approach, which is based on fairness, protection and autonomy. Uh, I'm not trying to sell the book I co-edited because it was my co-editor that did most of the work, but it's in the references. Um, one in three diagnosed mental health conditions in adulthood are known to directly relate to adverse childhood experiences. Children are not merely adults. Uh, waiting to grow up. They're not the adults to be. They, are a, they have unique value in their own stage of the life cycle. Uh, so I've not got time to go through this. I'm aware of the clock ticking. But there's been a lot of... If we just dealt with this as complex trauma and addressing childhood adversity and trauma, I think that's very important, but it doesn't have to be a diagnosis. It, it's a script that helps you understand young people who present to you in the mosque, in the church, in the, in the McDonald's, in the paediatric dentistry clinic, wherever you're working. Just think about it. And we know that children have to adapt to survive in their environment, to find ways of mitigating or tolerating the adversity they've experienced, to establish a sense of safety and control, and to make sense 
of, excuse my French, the shit that is surrounding them. So what kinds of experiences are adverse? And this is where we can drill down the vulnerable groups. So you don't need 250 vulnerable groups. You actually put them into these categories. I defy anybody from a vulnerable group not to say that they can't be put under these headings. Because we, we can't, we, at the moment what we're doing is we're frightening the horses. Uh, the, the, uh, we do some work for the minister in Wales and he said, if I listened to every lobbying group that came through my front door in the first two months when I was minister, um, and they told me how much I could save personally if I just did what they said. I could run the health service on Wales on no money. So we have to get more intelligent about our lobbying. The only thing to look at there is 9% of, 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 of people have experienced four or more adverse childhood experiences. How does it impact? Well, this is the economic argument. This is not an argument to have with the Department of Health and Social Care, where I have to declare I'm a board member. Um, but... It's an argument to have with other government departments. So go lobbying the other government departments, as, as our DH speaker said this morning. ACES, there's always a diagram that looks like a petal to make things better. Public Health invented these diagrams. And what can we do about it? So be prepared, be aware, look at the quotes that the young people say. And that's the last one, flexible, safe, responsible, because I want to use the last five minutes to just move on. So social media, very apt. I didn't, I didn't, I'd forgotten it was coming out today. Shame on me. So um, I tear out illegal bits of newspapers that belong to other people, but there we go. So, um, so Alice Thompson, um, don't all these journalists look youthful? They keep their photographs from when they were two, I think, sometimes. Sorry. Um, so it's, uh, so she says, what about parents should calm down about social media? It's working out how to use devices for gain, not pain and how to set boundaries for users and providers. And she says at the end, we um, don't need to be that draconian. We just need to apply, she says, the same standards. I would say better standards of behaviour online as we do offline. So I'm in a very interesting debate with my 13-year-old grandson now about the benefits of Fortnite. He's not won me over yet, uh, but there is a danger he will. He's a self-declared geek, and he says, this is my way of communicating. He's proud of that as well. Role models, so this is my favourite group in Sefton. That's what we want young people to feel about their identity. It's time to end this really stupid mind-body dualism that was just there to sort of give philosophers and people something to think about 200 years ago. So the social determinants of child health. Why aren't we working across child health? Give everybody the best possible start in life. So mom has given us all the science, but we have to turn the rhetoric into reality. So common causes of mortality and poor health and associated social determinants. So we need to be working with NCB and Russell Viner at the Royal College of Paediatrics and everybody else who wants to join us because they affect the whole of health. They have a very bad effect on birth weight. They have a very bad effect on rates of cancer in this group. They have a very bad effect on obesity, on mental health and oral health. So I've just struck up an association with a paediatric dentist and we're going to make lovely music together about identifying oral health better in young people with risk of mental disorder and then being willing to ask that one brave question of that child beyond their teeth that might suggest they've got bulimia but actually I need to ask another question because I think you might have something not quite right and do you want help but they're afraid to do it because if they ask the question will they have the confidence as part of the workforce to know what the next step is. And that's why the local commissioning is essential. You really do have to be able to phone a friend on a Friday afternoon. So the forward thinking, you can see that I'm a socio-psycho bio model person. So the new psychology of health, I can recommend you to you the unlocking of the social cure. Shared social identity, good positive group behaviour, because what matters in life is what goes on in the spaces between human beings, what spaces goes on between the very tiniest bits of DNA, that's what they're struggling with, with getting cures for cancer, and what happens in megaspace, I'm a bit of a star gazer, what happens between planets and universes. So if you have good positive social identity, you get social psychological resources and it gives you enhanced health and well-being. If you don't, you get a toxic sense of social identity, so my client group were young offenders and it was safer to be in a gang than not be in a gang what indictment is that on us as a society and you get compromised health and well-being so i've put a lot of quotes from young people into our bubble speak 
because that's what I have to do if I go and sit in front of a minister. So what we need is network positivity, collective wisdom of groups, and the journey we need to take is engagement. And engagement, in case you don't know, is about commitment and attachment. Dialogue, listening, co-construction across networks. But it will always, always involve compromise. There's never one answer. And in, to do this, we need to get into the shoes of our young people. We need to feel the fear and we need to do it anyway. So the journey is one to security of mind. Those are the references and uh, it's goodbye from me and it's goodbye from my very favourite, wonderfully functional, dysfunctionally family. So thank you for listening. <laughs>